Welcome to the Renegade Report. I'm Jonathan. And Ramon is present and has been mock safe from the coronavirus. A- apparently you have not though. No, no, I uh, think I might have been dying from it over the weekend. So um, <coughs> in your direction. And, um, and now you'll be, uh, that's the vaccine actually. If you right. get it and then you get over it and don't die. Then you'll be fine. Do you need like Jewish blood to have the vaccine or something? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, just hear, with that I trope. just hear people Thanks, dying. Thanks, Rashida Talib sitting next to me here. <laughs> <laughs> I just hear people are dying all over the world from this thing, and now you cured it. So, I mean, if you could, yeah. you know, tell the secrets for the cure, you could win. The like, secret is to not panic about a virus that is going to roughly infect somewhere between ten and 20,000 people and kill probably about 1,000 people of those uh, and yeah, not do much worse than what flu does almost every single day and has been doing for the last hundred years. Well, or so. I don't know. I mean, I read Nassim Taleb on this, and he says mm. pandemics, you know, in terms of probabilities and all that, we mustn't be so flippant about it. Nassim Taleb's problem is that he's an expert on absolutely everything, and um, sometimes he actually doesn't know that, that much. Well, he's and right I about think, IQ, though. I, I think on this, <laughs> he's definitely wrong on IQ, and he's, he's likely wrong on this. Uh, he, his argument being, uh, you know, this could be something that could be really dangerous, so we should pay a lot of attention to it. Um, cool, except I haven't seen him touting the dangers of climate change, because the argument could be made just as much to that or any other supposed existential threat to mankind. Um, yeah, I'm not buying it, and the epidemiology doesn't suggest that we should be that worried in this instance right. either. But apparently to prevent catching the coronavirus, you should just not have sex with animals. <laughs> that true? I saw a World Health Organization poster. Someone doctored, someone doctored a, 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 well, they doctored a real poster. They said you needed to have, um, when you had contact with farm animals or livestock, that you should protect yourself, and someone changed it to um, when you, instead of contact, when you have sex with them. So, um, oh. no. Um, but yes, I don't know what you've been doing, Ramon, <laughs> with your spare time. Uh, no judgment, really, although a little bit of judgment, because that's kind of not okay. I grew up on a farm. I don't live on a farm. <laughs> it's a big difference. The past is the past. We all agreed in 94. Yeah, what forget. happened on the farm stays on the farm. That's what That's what <laughs> Daisy said at the time. But anyway, we could horse around all day. Yes, we could. we could introduce our guest. You got gold. Right. Do you want to go for it? Yes, indeed. We, our guest today is Jimmy Ramahopa. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you guys for hosting me. No, no, the pleasure's all mine. Now, I've researched a little bit about you, but I think it always comes better from your mouth. Like, who are you? How did you get here? And uh, what are the big ideas we need to be talking about? Okay, I suppose the reason why I got here is because of, like, my passion projects, you know. Um, I'm a co-founder of the CoLab Movement. CoLab Movement is basically a, an NGO which is aimed at uh, collaborations amongst people of different races and sort of like counter, it's like sort of like the counter narrative of what's happening, the division that's happening amongst South Africans, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically what the CoLab movement is. Uh, Apart from that, uh, I have interest in socioeconomics, politics, you know? So I also do like a small podcast uh, that's called Politics SA, uh, where I do videos where I do like uh, audio podcasts and I also do animations from time to time, you know. <clears throat> Particularly that the reason for that is sort of like to spread a sort of like um, a counter narrative to the usual narratives that being that are being spread by either mainstream media or politicians, you know. Sort of like highlighting some facts, like in sort of like uh, short form snippets that are easy to consume and quick to consume for people, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. that's pretty much what I do, yeah. Uh, tell us a bit more about the NGO stuff. Uh, I'm interested because I've, you know, I've heard that black people and white people hate each other. Um, they can't be in a room together. I mean, this is a miracle, um, <laughs> right here, what's happening. And, yeah. um, you know, they, we just are completely on the brink of civil war, really. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to hear what, what you're doing with, with, with that, that, given yeah. the media narrative, which likes to sort of for clicks and 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 uh, the, and, and sales, really um, push a certain narrative. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, there's a whole notion that there is a black struggle, which is unique to black people, and there's a white struggle, which is unique to white people. You know, and um, to an extent, some of those narratives have merit, right? Mm. But then the problem becomes when that merit is used to like sort of like push uh, negative agendas. Né? 
such as trying to develop, uh, like, separate people, mm. to, trying to create scapegoats, you know, things like that, you mm-hmm. know. That's where the problem comes, you know. And through the collab movement, is, it's, 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 it's about, I, I want to call it a, a unity project, you know, where we can all acknowledge everyone has shortcomings. We can all acknowledge the issues that come from either side, whether black, white, whatever. Yeah? And through that, try to come up with um, common, common sort of like solutions, you know. Um, I'm sure later, maybe if we get a chance, we'll talk about the non-zero-sum aspect of it, yeah? where we um, discuss that there are, there are actually solutions that can work for everyone, you know, and we shouldn't necessarily have to create a, a common enemy, you know, or identify people as enemies mm. when, when there's actually solutions that we can all walk towards, you know. So that's what, on a higher level, what the NGO is about, right? So what we'll be doing soon is that we're going to be mobilizing young people, getting young people involved in social economics. We're going to be going to universities, recruiting people, you know, and sort of like creating structures where people can actually start um, becoming like a machine that drives unity, you know, because it, it all starts there, you know. If, if you have a machine that drives division, you need a machine that drives unity. If you agree that there are machines out there that drive division, then we actually need to do something about it and not wake up one morning and find the country burning and ask ourselves, how the hell did this happen? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, is unity sort of the highest value for the collab movement? Because, yeah. just sorry, a yeah. second part of the question, because I think unity sort of already exists in a material way. Yeah. If I speak to most people around the country, I travel often, I speak to lot, you know, lots of people. People generally care about the same sort of things. The surveys out from the various NGOs we quote very often say the same thing as well. The land reform is not important. Jobs are very important. And this is, cuts across most race groups. And yeah. like people do have the same sort of ambitions and fears and the same sort of ideas about what will make the country better. Yeah. So when you say unity, like what do you actually mean by that? As opposed to, do you think there is disunity or that the disunity is look, increasing? Yeah, look, I don't think the country was ever united, first of all, right? Um, Post-94. There's never really been... Um, like a deliberate effort for people to sort of like come together. There's always been a them and us, you know, it's always existed. Um, there are, of course, initiatives, there are people, common, like ordinary people who have common visions, common goals, right? But what we've noticed over time is that there are elements that are coming in that are widening that gap, you know? Um, I wouldn't say that I would, in my opinion, I wouldn't say that South Africans are unified. I mean, like, you see it every day. I mean, like, social media is, is, we see it on social media, and people might say that social media is a small representation of reality, right? It's not actually a real representation of reality, but what comes out of social media is based on some reality, you know? The fact that people are quick to call people um, settlers, um, you know, or other terms that can come from either one side or the other, you know? Mm. It shows that, um, you know, inside, you know, there's something that's missing, you know? And, 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 and that's, that's what the collab movement is about, really. It's just to try to counter other elements that are trying to actually widen the gap, you know? That's what I mean. So, other, so you're an anti-political party movement, really, because the political parties in this country really exist to, to uh, sow division. Um, we, if, you, if there wasn't, if there was more supposed unity in the country, I imagine the EFF would have a hard time existing, uh, certainly as a party. Um, and and they're, they're the one that really springs to mind because they're very um, strict. Uh, other than uh, what was that party? Uh, six people part of it. I think Black Land First. Eh? Black um, <laughs> uh, it's only six people. BLF, so yeah. so I mean they were very divisive in saying you know you yes. can't join if you if you're white, um, which got them thrown off the, the, the thrown out of the IEC. But yeah. but. Um, you know the EFF is quite divisive. They go out to be divisive. I think they they 
pick up a lot of support by being divisive because they, they do pick topics that are uh, appeal to certain people and definitely are, are enraging to other people. Um, but all the political parties, to some extent or, or, or less, um, the FF plus on one side might be accused of similar tactics yeah. to the EFF. Um, the DA and ANC uh, all, uh, also like to play the game as much as they both, um, you know, the ANC wants a better life for all. And um, the DA has basically copied their homework and has, what, one nation one, for one all? South one South Africa. One South Africa, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's all the same crap. Um, you know, they, they just... Uh, they, they just um, feeding off the same PR agencies. Um, so they claim that, but then in the stuff they talk about, um, they can be relatively divisive. I mean, the, the ruling party certainly is responsible for a fair amount of division in the country in the way they've approached policy making. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got an interest in all the politics. What do you think of, of um, oh, I suppose, the political climate and and what you're trying to do, but also what's, what, what situation we find ourselves in and, and, and the responsibility that politicians and, and, and that environment has uh, for, for the South Africa we have. Yeah, so you, you're quite right in saying that uh, politicians have a way of driving divisions, right? Mm. Because you need, as a politician, you need to develop a constituency, right? And that particular constituency needs to have particular features Right? And they need to be grouped in a particular way. You know? mm. So the best way, there the are two ways of creating a group or a constituency. It's either you develop a common vision or you develop a common enemy mm. or threat. Right? Throughout history, that's how it's always been. Right? Mm. The problem is that a lot of our politicians, they develop a common enemy. You know, Through terms like white monopoly capital, what does it mean? What does white monopoly capital mean? You know, like, even though they might have an actual definition which says, okay, it's based on the fact that the majority of private owned companies are white, excuse me, are white, mm. hence the term white monopoly capital, that's what we mean. And of course, if a majority of the private sector is white, chances are the networking and the transactions and the businesses will be amongst white people hence the monopoly capital, right? But what they've done, as I said, like some narratives have merit, but what they're doing is that they take that merit and they, they create an enemy out of it. You see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? Um, one might argue that um, th that, that's what politicians do, you know? So they create a common enemy. And once you create a common enemy, um, we might find ourselves in in, in, in in political instability, you know, because history has proven itself, you know. Mm. Talking about the Durban riots, right, which happened, I think it was in, I can't quite remember, but during that time... 91. Yeah, but, but, but during that time, during the Durban riots, right, mm. yeah, um, the common enemy was Indian people, right? And over a number of days... Indian people in Durban were slaughtered, right? It all started like this, where um, there's like struggle amongst a particular group, mm. and then you create the narrative that this particular group is struggling because of the enemy, right? And we should learn from history that when once you do that, at some point, uh, people will react, you know? And... And, and, and that's the problem, and, and hence the need for, for such initiatives, you know, like the CoLab movement or, other, or any other initiatives, or the importance of us discussing here yeah, so that people can be aware, you know, and not take um, comments or remarks lightly, you know, that are made by politicians, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So I agree with you there. I think, I think political rhetoric... Is, is quite important in some ways, but not in the ways that CNN talks about Donald Trump when he calls Kim Jong-un rocket man. It's like a, it's a very good insult that displays power. It's not meant to incite war by any means. But in South Africa, I mean, we can see the way politicians speak about groups of people. It's uh, often very violent and, you know, couched in metaphor, but we sort of understand what they want to do. But in terms of, I just want to go back to the unity thing, right? Mm. 
Here's the thing. Now, this is not my argument, but I think it's an argument some people may listen, who may listen, will make. Yeah. What does the con- a conception of justice in the Zulu Kingdom mm. and the conception of justice in Cape Town and the conception of justice on a farm in the Northwest, those three conceptions of what justice is are so far removed from each other, mm-hmm. it's basically impossible to unify mm. those three conceptions. So is it better to unite the Zulu, the English liberal and the Afrikaner on his farm or is it better for those sort of people to live in the communities they want to live in that share their views and then sort of trade with each other? Yeah, look, um, unity <clears throat> and diversity, I think, can they can coexist, you know. Um, the, only, the only issue is when um, there's a them and us rhetoric, right? Mm. Um, th- I think that's the only thing, you know? If we can accept that we are different, you know? We can accept that we have different values. We can accept that we have uh, different justice systems. Let me put it that way. Um, but the moment we start um, othering other people, that, that it's, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. It happens even amongst the black communities, as we've seen with the xenophobic attacks, right? The xenophobic attacks are a result of othering, right? Mm. So the, the, uh, black people have, have, have not necessarily been homogenous, like even in southern sub-Saharan Africa. You know, we've no, always had tribes. Of course not. I mean, that's a, we've if, always had, if I had to say that, I'll be called a racist, and rightly yeah. so. Right? Yeah, but what I'm saying is that even then, even though we know that the Zulu nation slaughtered a lot of other tribes, yes. right? The fact that the narrative after that was that we are all South Africans, or at least we are all black South Africans, then no one really, you know, looks at the fact that Zulu people slaughtered people. You know what I'm saying? But now we have this idea that they are Europeans and they are South Africans, you know, mm. or Africans rather. And there hasn't been that that bridge. There hasn't been that unity. You see what I'm saying? That that's what I mean. You see. So so the fact that I still see you as a settler, you know, then psychologically it means you're an outsider. Understand? Mm. And the same way, it doesn't, it's not unique to white people, as we've seen. It's also the same with Zimbabweans, you know? Uh, the way I see a Zimbabwean, I see a Zimbabwean as an, as an outsider. You see what I mean? So, of course, if in a difficult situation, especially when there's a scramble for resources, I'm going to attack the Zimbabwean. You see what I'm saying? So that's what's happening. That's what we're seeing now. There's a scramble for resources. And because white people are other people, um, you know, we see them as the enemy. You see what I mean? It, it just happens. Yeah, I mean, you you brought up those, sorry, those, the Durban riots you brought up, I think, were much earlier, 49, I think. Um, but yes. um, the, the, so this othering concept is interesting because um, I, think, I think it's quite complex. Uh, I don't see it as a complete negative, uh, frankly. Um, uh, firstly, it's a protect, protective instinct within humans that... Uh, what they know is what they know. Uh, that starts with your nuclear family, then moves out into your community, uh, and now in sort of modern times moves out with into into states. For example, mm-hmm. um, you know, one example you you give is in South Africa. We still have people who will refer to me as being European. Uh, I wasn't born in Europe. I don't hold a European passport. I am, as far as I'm concerned, South African. Um, but yes, we do we do have those kinds of issues. Uh, but the the idea around othering uh, bothers me a little bit in that it perpetuates the the idea of the collective. Those riots happen because you can collectivize a group. Um, so you, as one group, can be a collective, which is seen as the good collective, Mm -hmm. and the other group is seen as the bad collective, Mm -hmm. and then that justifies whatever then happens. Um, And and obviously there's a whole element of uh, a lack of justice that that comes into this. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in South Africa we have uh, maybe a lack of resources, so uh, people in the township get upset, and then because they have a lack of resources, 
uh, the school and the the local school and the local library have already been burnt down, so they can't burn that down. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they must uh, attack the guy who owns the spaza shop who doesn't happen to be South African. Mm-hmm. Um, that happens, I don't believe, just because of othering. I have, think that happens because there's no consequence. Uh, uh, there's no justice. Um, if, uh, number one, we had gun laws that allowed that guy to blow anyone who walked into his shop with the intent of violence, uh, against the back wall with a shotgun, um, it wouldn't happen as much, number one. And um, number two, if the police and the justice system worked and the people who were caught, who we often have filmed on camera, running away with bags of, of, of goods, um, it, this wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as much of an issue. I, you know, there was a clip last year of some riots in downtown Joburg after... Uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff that went down. It was also related to xenophobia. Mm. And there was there was a store that was raided. It was one of these big uh, um, sort of stores, a game or a Dion's or some, one of those type of stores. And uh, there was <laughs> a, a, someone running with a television. <laughs> and um, the cops shot him with a, with a rubber bullet. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was instant justice. Like you saw in his face, he went, oh, shit. I did something wrong. I've been caught doing the wrong thing. Sorry, sorry, I'm out. It's cool, I'm out. Thanks. Okay, and and um, I think we've completely lost a lot of that in South Africa. There is no, uh, there is no kind of actual justice, and especially for really high crimes. Uh, you know, there's justice if I speed. You know, I'm very interested to see the the transport minister. Mm. Uh, managed to track down a guy who drove at 300 kilometers an hour. Yes, it's illegal. Yes, it's highly dangerous. Uh, But he did it, and nobody was harmed. Uh, And we spent actual resources tracking that man down Mm. and having them arrested uh, when, in fact, we haven't yet arrested one person who's defrauded this country of trillions of rands. Uh, so, So I think justice plays a big role, and I think a lot of South Africans... Either one, know that justice has failed, there is no police coming, there is no court that's going to find in your favor ultimately. And, um, but, but, so that's the one side of it, but I, I, I want to get back to this idea of othering and the collective. Mm. Um, I, I, I think like what you're trying to do is good, but I would, would hope that it looks at uh, emphasizing the individual. Uh, so it's not Afrikaners because, as we saw this week on social media, you had someone like Paulie van Veik turning around and going, well, I'm not like Afriforum. Uh, and that's cool for Paulie. Good for her. Um, and it's true. She can be her own person. And the people who are part of Afriforum can be their own people. They can form a group and say, we roughly agree with this. But you, even within that group, you would find people who differ. Um, on specific things. And I think uh, something that's really missing in the South African political landscape is an understanding of individualism and a real push around people being individuals. You know, uh, it's not that you're black, so it means this. You're white, so it means that. You're Afrikaner, it means this. It doesn't always mean those things, as we know from our individual interactions. Yeah. Yeah, individualism is a very uh, complex matter. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Particularly because... I don't, I don't fully agree with it. I get it. I get it, right? I get that. Um, like, come on. Not like, okay, white people, like the general statement would be white people have control of the economy, right? But obviously, I, I can't just walk towards any random person and say, hey, give me a piece of the economy or whatever, or give me a piece of land, you know? <laughs> Chances are that person doesn't own land or doesn't run a business, right? I get it. I get the idea of individualism, right? Uh, but in, 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 in South Africa, what happened was that um, there was an, a system that exists, yeah, which went for collectivism, mm-hmm. right? And that's what it did, right? It, we, we are in this situation right now because of collectivism, right? The people who are where they are today, they didn't look at them and say, uh, okay, let's look at your skills, let's look at the merit, and so on and so forth. They literally said, okay, you are white, right? And then let's look at the job reservation for you because you are white, right? So we are in this mess right now because of collectivism, right? And then um, for us to immediately switch off, right, in terms of trying to correct it and sort of like switch it off, right, I think we must be a little bit careful. That's in my opinion, 
right? That, okay, I understand the idea, I understand, I get individualism, but people, um, as human beings, right, we benefit as a collective, right? We're still divided because of collectivism, right? And people still benefit because of that, right? Um, stupid example, right? Um, when one person in the family has had access to particular opportunities, <coughs> when one person has had like, access to particular opportunities, um, chances are that person's siblings or parents or children and so on and so forth have access to the same opportunities, right? So now we are two, about a generation after apartheid, right? So that generation is still sort of like enjoying the proceeds of the previous regime of collectivism. So right now, sure, there's no apartheid, right? But the proceeds of apartheid are still in, in motion. They're still in fact. You see what I'm saying? And that's where the difficulty is, you see. That's why, that's why, that's why I get individualism, but I also recognize what collectivism is doing, you know? You, you know where there's some of the issue with that argument is, is this is the, the white beneficiaries of apartheid. All white people are beneficiaries of apartheid argument. Um, and unfortunately, it falls flat for me in many places. Firstly, the apartheid system very clearly um, uh, um, advantaged certain white people. It did not aim to advantage all white people. Um, it may have ended up advantaging many white people inadvertently by disadvantaging black people. Um, but it, it certainly, uh, so as the ANC appoints uh, cadres to specific positions and it's always the same people who get the BE deals and it's always the same people who get the tenders and all those types of things and it's kind of this revolving carousel of the, the characters we've come to know. Um, no different with the apartheid government. It was also a revolving carousel of the same people, the same families tied to the same people. So I think you can you can make the argument around certain people and certain families and certain groupings. Um, I think it becomes quite difficult and not quite difficult. I think it's untrue to say that it applied to all white people. Secondly, there's the issue around the fact that following the collapse of the Soviet Union, this country had a massive influx of people who would be considered white from the Eastern Bloc countries um, who didn't benefit one iota from apartheid. Uh, they arrived here in the 90s. Uh, and made lives for themselves. Uh, these are people from uh, what is now the Ukraine, uh, Czech Republic, uh, all over actually, Russia. Um, there, there's a number of these people. So, so just as a collective, just uh, that's just one example, and and I could go on because the apartheid government was hardly friendly to Jews who are seen as white in this country. Um, you know, there, there are many communities that were not exactly uh, 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 loved by the apartheid government, even though they may not have been writing specific laws against them. Um, and in fact, certain of the Mediterranean communities, for example, were successful because they went, oh, well, we're not really going to get government work here. We're not, we're not one of the government favored people, but we're going to create within our own community success. And they did. Um, so, uh, uh, and even within black communities, uh, you know, uh, we've got a we've got a guy starting a new political party um, off the back of an of a of a business he built into a multi million uh, dollar empire, uh, basically during a time when theoretically that wasn't possible. And I'm not taking away the feat that that create that, that he. He, he did in creating that. I'm just saying that it's a little bit more complex than all black people were just completely put down, all white people benefited. Um, I think that those, and that's a collectivist attitude. And so perhaps you can answer some of that, but also you can answer why if collectivism was wrong by the apartheid government, which we agree it was, why it is right by the new South African government. Okay. <clears throat> Um, okay, so the nuance is that I'm not saying that all white people yeah. are beneficiaries <laughs> of a patent. Yeah? Hashtag not all. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... <clears throat> look, I know people don't like generalizations, right? Yeah. But the fact is that a generalization is, is actually a scientifically accepted thing, you know? Mm. Yeah, like the mean, the average mean average, whatever, you know? So, 
When, when I say white people, mm-hmm. right, I'm, I'm unapologetically generalizing, right, with, the, with the, the disclaimer that says, of course I know that not all white people are beneficiaries of apartheid, right? <clears throat> and then, but then when we look at um, the demographics, but in terms of like household incomes, all, all of these are available on status C, you know? And we look at, um, yeah, like how, how, how white, how much white people earn, right? Mm. And how much black people earn, right? Um, generally, white people are better off, right? Whichever scientific way you want mm. to come to that conclusion, sure. it, will, it will tell you but, that. But Indians were yeah. almost as bad off as black people. Yeah, Indians. And then are now better off. Yeah. But, so what's the problem there? Okay, but the apartheid was like a hierarchy, right? Okay. So you had whites, you had Indians, you had uh, coloreds, and you had black people, right? So even in employment, it was white, Indians, coloreds, and black people. Even in, in the de- demographics of, of, of household incomes, right? It's white people at the top, Indians, um, coloreds, and black people, right? Um, and that's not a coincidence, right? It's, it's not a coincidence. So black people didn't sort of like wake up and find themselves in this situation. It was systematic, you know, through exclusions, like the difficulty of entering university, you know. There were so many black people who actually qualified Right to actually enroll in universities, mm-hmm. but universities there was there were white only universities. Um, there was a certain number of black students that could only be accepted in certain universities. You know, and that's why we are here. You know, um, th- that's a reality. You know what I'm saying? It's not. It's not. It's not something that's made up. You know. So I understand that. I understand individualism, as I said. Right, and it's it may seem unfair to sort of like group people, you know? But at some point, there needs to be a solution, right, that we need to, to find, right, that will sort of like counter what happened in the past, you know? And I'll admit that um, it's, not, it's, it's not clean. It's not a clean process. It's never going to be a clean process, right? Because the situation that we are dealing with isn't clean. Right, so I'm not saying that we should have reverse apartheid. Of course, I'm not saying that we should um, exclude white people from the economy or from opportunities or things like well, that. It's already done. I mean, that's yeah, no, no, that's it's been why, done. Yeah, that's why I don't agree with BE. Yeah, okay. right. I don't agree with BE. Well, it's not working, but it's been done. Yeah, yeah. but I still say that there needs to be race-based policy. I'm not saying that, because I know BE doesn't work, right? But because of the context, because of what happened, right, we we do have to look at race. Race is like the elephant in the room. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's 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 where that's where I talk about non-zero sum. Yeah. Empowerment. Before, before yeah. we get to that, so this this thing about restitution, I think is what you're talking about. It has always interested me because. Our argument for the longest time has been, well, my argument, but Jonathan, I think, agrees with this. People are generally poor not because they don't have resources, it's because they don't have rights. Um, so in South Africa then and South Africa now, you have 18 million black people living on land that doesn't belong to them, like tribal land and, and um, you know, land that belongs to the state. Uh, they're squatting on it or they're renting it, but they can't really bequeath it to their children and it's not generating any capital or wealth for them. So that's one aspect. Number two, (coughs) excuse me, the education system is practically nationalized for a lot of these people. So they don't determine where the children go to school. They don't determine the curriculum. They don't determine a variety of things. And number three, the health services are nationalized for these people as well. And due to the variety of factors that take away their fundamental rights, they can never actually self-actualize and go up uh, in social mobility in a material way. Now, the solution, of course, is to give them the rights to land, to choice, to a variety of things. And that will make them, let's say, on equal footing at the bottom of the ladder 
with the rest of us middle class people. But that is not restitution as such. It's just righting a wrong, if that makes sense. Mm. So if we agree that that is the first step, give them their rights back, what more can be done to accentuate the social mobility of those people? Because they really don't have those rights anyway right now under yeah. the anti government, Look, right? The <clears throat> property rights, I agree with you 100%, right? The fact that the ANC government uh, withheld uh, title deeds to RDP beneficiaries, I think that yeah. is wrong, you know? Um, tribal land also, a huge issue for me, right? Um, so, so I agree with you. So I agree with you there, you know? Um, but then what I believe needs to happen is that we need a deliberate development of the people who are not developed yet, you know? And more needs to be done than just sort of like... Because, because here's the thing, right? Um, equal opportunity, right? Mm. Uh, spoken about a lot. Like, hey, why don't we just give everyone equal opportunity, yeah. right? Equal opportunity is not equal, it's not the same as equal access, right? Just because you and I have the equal opportunity to do something doesn't mean that we have equal access, right? Sure. What would equal yeah. access be? I mean, Look, um, <clears throat> everyone has equal opportunity to achieve the necessary marks yes. to attend Harvard. Not yes. everyone will be given the access to attend Harvard. So, based so, on what? Though? That's that's what we need but, to look at. Well, ba space, based really? on space, based on just the reality yes, that yeah. Harvard can only take X number of students per year, and only once students in certain ways that that they will see will uplift their school or represent their school in yeah. the correct fashion. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Look, it's a lot of things. Yeah. Right? Uh, but in, in the South African context, mm -hmm. right? What is access? Wait, yeah, look, in the South African we, context, what is South African access? access? If we look at like a simple thing yeah. right, that people take for granted, right? It's the the geography, you know, the spatial planning, you know, that certain things are located in certain areas which are easily accessible for certain people, versus a person who's already poor and has to, I don't know, <clears throat> hustle or transport money, et cetera, et cetera, to access the same thing, right? Like right. we have a lov lovely library in Senton next to Nelson Mandela Square. It's got Wi-Fi, you know. I think you can, I'm not sure if you can still access computers there or, or whatever, you know. Mm. I mean, like, that's it. If you, if you go there and if you're serious about yourself, you can literally go there, sit there, open up, study, you have, and do whatever, you know. A child in Soweto, or deep loot has equal opportunity, right, to access that library. No one's going to stop that child, right? But do, does he has does he have equal access to it? Maybe not, you know. So it's because of what it's because of how things are set up that we actually need to, you know, try to see what else needs to happen. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, in some ways. Yeah. So when you talk about, you wrote a piece about the sort of non-zero sum empowerment, yes. and you have a, and you discriminate between development and redistribution. Yes. So redistribution, I think most of us understand what that is. You yeah. take money from the wealthy and you give it to the poor in some other way. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by development as maybe a better option? Look, um, development, right? In in my opinion, right. Is, is better than redistribution. Right? Because re redistribution, we've seen, we've seen what it's done. People do like... Uh, um, okay, so basically development yeah, allows a person to sort of like sustain themselves, right? And I think that's what we should start making our focus towards, right? So because even with the land claims, yeah, mm -hmm. people apply for the land claims, they get the land, the first thing they do is they sell it, and then the money, I don't know what they do with the money, you know? But it shows that people are not developed yet. People are not um, able to think about, okay, how can I leverage the value of this land to perhaps buy equipment and perhaps turn it into something that will actually be productive? You know what I'm saying? 
And that's what the majority of black people need, right? Unfortunately, because of Bantu education and, low, and substandard education, they were not allowed that opportunity, you know, to think outside being mere workers. You know what I'm saying? So when I talk about uh, race policy, right, I say we need a race policy, right, but that race policy needs to be focused on development, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, positioning a random black person and making that person a CEO, rather incentivize companies that do businesses with black-owned companies, with other black-owned companies, you know? Because what does that do? It actually gets them into the system, gets them into the system of trading, and also holds, holds them accountable for something, you know? Instead of merely placing someone who... And, and it also develops them, you know what I'm saying? So, and, 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 that's, and, that's, and, that's, and that's my idea around it, you know? That, that's where you have the, the non-zero sum of it, right? Mm -hmm. That the white company doesn't actually lose anything, you know? They can still get... They are, they are still getting the services that they need, right? It's not just sort of like preferred procurement. Yeah, it's, it, it's part of triple BEE, right? right? That's why I don't disagree with everything in triple BEE. I disagree with BEE because BEE was mostly focused on like directors and ownership, right? Yeah, quotas, yeah. yeah. But triple BEE also looks at um, development, right? It looks at you, you get triple BEE points from training people. You know what I'm saying? Putting people in a course, training them, giving them skills, etc., etc. You get points, you know, and and that's what we need more of, you know, as opposed to merely, you know, positioning people. Yeah, yeah. sorry, John, I just want to get mm. that in. You. So I know quite a few people in this sort of space that that sort of want to help train people to develop skills and all that. And I mean, I'm afraid to say that that the stock at hand is is has been very damaged. By, by the education system. Um, there's a... I know a chap who does training as an NGO, and he says just, just every year, lots of people apply, they come in, and like they, they try to train these, these poor people to do something um, with skills development, and it's just becoming a lot more difficult because the education system just really like saps the, that creativity and dynamism out of people. Uh, and so you have people trying to do this and it's just not working out because these people have been scarred maybe for life yeah. by the abhorrent education system we have. Yeah. Look, there are different ways. Some, some work, some don't work. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a beneficiary of uh, EE, Employment Equity, right, through the bursary scheme, right? right? So the company that sponsored my education, right, got a tax break for every year that they sponsored me, right? So what happens is that they don't lose anything yeah. because they actually get the money back through tax breaks, you know? And at the end of the day, um, they've educated at least one more black person. You see what I'm saying? So this is where um, private sector, right, which we can't deny that it's majority white, right, can actually work with um, like the rest of the country, you understand? So it's not about just swapping faces and putting faces there, but sort of like utilizing everyone's resources, whether from the private sector or whether from the government, you know, give tax incentives to wherever the private sector can help out, you know? And that's how we can actually start getting more people who are actually of high quality. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's market incentives. So, so tax incentives I've got no problem with because yeah. the less tax money, <clears throat> excuse me, the government collects, the better, and um, the less they can steal and, and just squander. Yeah. Um, so I've got no problem with those kinds of policies. Um, but we have a parastatal called ESCOM, yeah. uh, which is in this exact predicament because of the triple BEE you describe. So what happens is there is an engineering firm they know electricity, they know uh, distribution, whatever it happens to be, um, and production. Uh, they, because they've been in it for 40 years, uh, their biggest client has always been ESCOM, 
but they're a bunch of white guys. And um, yeah, you know, a couple of black guys involved, but they don't own the company. And the guys who own the company aren't willing to just hand over their company to a 30-year-old engineer. The 55-year-old engineers who uh, worked up in the company from the previous now 95-year-old engineers are not willing to just hand over the company to a 30-year-old because he happens to have a little bit more melanin in his skin. Nice guy, but you know that's just not they're not they're not really there. Yeah. So they go to Escom and they go, "Hey, um, we still want to help you produce and distribute e electricity, and and we we have the expertise and the knowledge and the skills, and you've always come to us for X projects." Um, and Escom goes, "Yeah, but." You know, now we've got these rules, and these rules say you're, you're too white for us to work with you. So one of two things then happens. Uh, one, one possibility is um, the 30-year-old engineer or maybe another 30-year-old engineer who happens to be a black dude opens his own consulting firm, uh, then goes to ESCOM. Uh, they, uh, he consults the white firm, so he's actually getting the, the knowledge, a lot of the knowledge and the institutional knowledge from them, uh, but he's got to obviously make his cuts because they're going to charge their fee. Yeah. Uh, so what ends up happening is we have a parastatal, so it's a taxpayer-owned entity, essentially, um, which is now going to be charged more because a guy's got to make his cut for no apparent reason. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's one option of what happens. That's actually the the the, the lesser of the two evils because at yeah. least the actual knowledge is provided, the actual service is provided, yeah. and everyone kind of arguably wins in the end, except the taxpayer who pays thirty, but anywhere between thirty and three hundred percent more for the service, mm -hmm. as we've seen with Madupi. Yeah. Um, or alternatively, what then happens is they go, no, we can't have any of the white guys. So we're going to just go with anyone who isn't a white guy, who isn't a white company, because white equals bad, black equals good. Mm. And let me make this very clear. Sometimes white will be equal bad, and sometimes white will equal good, mm -hmm. because it has nothing to do with skin color, and the same goes for black or Indian or any other race. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with the race. It's got to do with people, their knowledge, their ability, their ethics, their morals, the services they can and can't offer, the things they're willing to lie about when they pitch, all, all this kind of stuff. Mm. So what will then happen is the worst evil is a guy who actually doesn't know what he's doing comes along and goes, I will give you the same service you were going to get from those guys. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the person asking for the service goes, all right, well, you fit into the box we've now been told we have to get. It's a, not a merit box. So we're not actually checking whether you can actually do this. Mm -hmm. We're first checking the box of demographic. So we check the demographic box, we take you, and as a result, 18 months later, we have a conveyor belt that breaks down because it turns out you need to oil it every week. And this guy didn't tell us, and oh, damn, because he didn't know that, so here we are. Mm. Um, and these are the, the, the sort of dangers of these systems which um, refuse to accept the realities of that on the ground. And the biggest yeah. problem with this, sorry, just interrupt. The biggest problem is it screws the taxpayer, the person they, they appoint who, who checks the demographic box, but he's being put in a position where he's not competent enough, so that uh, destroys his self-confidence and abilities, and it screws the taxpayer, and it screws ESCOM. Yeah. So, and the poor people are the ones who suffer the most. Yeah, the and, and the focus on race screws everyone, including the person who's so-called you know, benefiting well, I mean, from it. Arguably, well. arguably, if you look at the ESCOM situation as one example, um, the the if we're going to say, you know, if we let's go with the hashtag all white people for a second. Okay. If if we go with that, um, the people that have suffered the least from the ESCOM debacle is the hashtag white people. Why is that? Well, as you point out, the white people make up uh, uh, most, a lot of white people fill up the middle class, so they're not the biggest portion of it. But certainly as a percentage of how many white people there are in the country, there, a lot of them are middle class. And they can do things like buy inverters. And some of them may have even be wealthy enough to put solar panels on their roofs or buy generators. The, the, that kid who wants to access the Santon library, well, now, never mind not accessing the library, he can't even have power at home because we have had to make rules that said we had to buy coal from 
a black dude, not a white dude. Yeah. And now we have a situation where we gave a trillion bucks to some Indians who now live in Dubai. And th- those are the literal effects of those policies, you know? Yeah. And the literal effects of refusing to have competent people as CEOs. Dudu Mieni at the head of SAA, we now have a defunct airline, one of the oldest airlines in the world, was used to be one of the best airlines in the world. Um, that, that It's not about race necessarily. There may be many black people, many white people who could run that organization, but we ticked certain boxes. In that case, you know, friends, friends with benefits, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I get very worried. You know, when you talk about tax incentives to educate people, I like that stuff. We talk about education, um, pro-education. I personally, I don't think government should be in education. And I think we should be pumping money into especially poorer areas um, so that they can get the same type of quality education that a kid living in Santon gets. Yeah. Um, and those are things I would absolutely be behind um, and absolutely are things we need to correct. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, you speak to that kind of stuff about correction, and I, I think that's cr- true. Yeah. Uh, but we need to be so careful with some of these policies where, um, you know, they try to correct the past. Um, and the it's, it's that old thing of, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. Um, if you were being very polite to the ANC government... Um, you would say that everything they've done for the past 25 years has been a good intention paving the road to hell. Um, that I say being polite because I think a lot of it is intentional because I yeah. know that they're basically commies at the end of the day. But, um, you know, if, if, if you don't believe that, that's fine. You might have just thought they were trying to do the best for everyone. Um, like someone like Peter Bruce thinks this. Um, and so they put in a whole bunch of policies in place and this is where we end up. Yeah. Look... Um, look, um, one thing that I hate about BE, you know, yeah. is that all it did was it created board members. <laughs> sure. And middlemen. Yes. Yeah, you know I'm saying. So it didn't create black industrialists, which is what it was supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? It didn't, you know? Mm. Uh, I'm sure the likes of Dudu Mieni wouldn't even know how to start their own thing. I'm not sure if they do, but... <laughs> Probably and, not. Yeah, and run it, you know, yeah. and, and, and actually see the numbers and actually see the, the complexities, mm. right? And that's what we need. We need to develop, um, I will say, black people, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. So that they know the numbers, they know how to run stuff, they know how to start things and run things, Yeah. We- yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. carry on. No, Sorry, no. apologies. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I've been talking a lot. <laughs> no, no, but 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 I do get what you're saying in yeah. terms of the dangers. Yeah, yeah. Right, the dangers, and and hence hence I'm an advocate of incentivizing, right? Uh, because there's an old saying that says uh, you cannot uplift the poor by taking down the rich, right? So we cannot uplift the poor by making things more difficult for people who have kept, right? Mm. It's unfortunate. It's one of those things where it's like, ah, oh, snap. These guys stole, you know? These guys um, excluded black people from the economy, right? I'm talking about the not general. all white people, yeah. but I'm talking about... No, we don't get those, offended here. Yeah. We, can, bother. Yeah. <laughs> we, get, we yeah. have much worse. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that for the economy to work, we actually need to allow them to continue doing it, right? Yeah. Right? But find a way to uplift those who are not uplifted before, right? And that's where the non-zero sum comes in, Mm. right? Just to explain what the zero sum is, so so the zero sum is what BE does, right? Um, For a black person to gain, the white person has to lose something, right? It could be shareholding, it could be, I don't know, you know? So that's why, yeah, yeah. Yeah. capital. EWC is land. Yeah, you know? So someone has to lose something for someone to gain, right? So what I'm saying is that um, you need intelligent policy where those who have not gained, gain, continue to gain, Mm -hmm. and without those who have capital, without them losing much. Right, mm. but this is this is sorry to interrupt. This has been done over and over again. Yeah. like we know what it, what 
yeah. what it is. It's called it, capitalism. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, the, the issue of incentivizing, right? Whether you, you like it or not, you're still going to get taxed 45%, right? But if you participate in the development, you'll get taxed 35%. It's up to you whether you want to get taxed the 45%. Or you want to get text the thirty five percent? You know what I'm saying, and and that's that's and that's 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 what we're driving. That that's that's what I think, in my opinion. Mm. I so, may I may be wrong. Right? No, no, no. But but in in my opinion, I think here's my if, the, if I may. My yeah. opinion is, if we had growth rates of Ethiopia today of ten point eight percent for the last twenty five years, incentives and policies and all that bullshit won't matter one. Thing. It won't matter at all because we would have a, a middle class of 20 million people. We would have a poverty rate of sub 10, an unemployment rate of under 5%. Yep. And we, everyone would have been much wealthier, much more prosperous, and race relations would be much better. And there would be no threat of EWC or the nationalization of healthcare or any of that bullshit. The only reason we are in this predicament right now is because. Racial nationalism is the order of the day in South Africa. It has been for a century and may well continue until the ANC loses power one day if they ever do so. The only reason we are in this thing is because people looked at things through a racial lens in the past and in the present as well. Yeah, look, in, in the past, yes. Of course, if we didn't have apartheid, I think this would have been one of the most prosperous countries, right? We wouldn't be talking about even after apartheid, it could be one of the most prosperous yeah. countries. I mean, uh, of course, no, but, but I mean, what I'm saying, China has. I mean, I don't want to be an authoritarian communist state like China, but it, it is possible if you care about efficiency, expertise, professional civil service, and a vision. Like it can happen. Rwanda, genocide of almost a million people. 30 mm. years ago. Absolute ruin, no foreign direct investment. Now 8% GDP growth yeah. for the past uh, decade and a half. Like, it's, it, it can be done M and Mauritius. it's easily done. Yeah, look. Uh, yeah, I, I, so, I, look, the, my issue is, you, you, the problem with this race lens is uh, over time, you know, and, and uh, if this podcast lasts on the internet for 30 years, um, <laughs> ultimately you're going to end up in a situation where we can carry on doing this thing where we go the white people and the white monopoly capital. Monopoly capital, as it happens, is a term that was um, invented by the Marxists. Mm. Um, so they just added the W in front of the MC. Um, monopoly capital was always about targeting the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. um, and WMC. So it's, it's, a, it's quite an old concept. Mm. Um, but the, 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 the bottom line is... is, is over time, uh, it's already started to happen. Um, it, the initial wave was uh, late 90s um, and uh, early 2000s, and now there's another wave of immigration. So your white population is dwindling. Relative terms in percentage, regardless of immigration, um, the white population is going to make up a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of this pie in this country in terms of the population and ultimately in terms of the actual wealth. Um, yep. The real question is going to come in is, at what point will people be like, um, the white boogeyman is literally a boogeyman. There are no white people. Yep. You know, black folk are going to walk through the shopping malls um, telling, you know, having conversations if, if they're particularly politically inclined and they think in this particular fashion. Yep. Um, they're going to say things like, the white people, the white people. And the kids might go, what are white people? Yeah. You know, these are going to be people living in Sandhurst, which is already populated by most of the the wealthy black folk in this country, as yeah. well as the white folk, yeah. with the wealthy white folk, people well wealthier than you and I, yeah. um, you know, are, who are black, white, Indian, and, and everything else. Um, and uh, they, the, there is already there is already this dwindling WMC, so to speak. Yeah. And over time, really, this 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 whole white black narrative is just going to fall down, and all you're going to left be left with essentially is blaming this thing that used to exist um this thing that 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 was you know it's the it's the 
Mm. It's the colonialism uh, blame game, for example. Yeah. It's like, cool, yeah, a whole bunch of guys rocked up 400 years ago. Um, they were pretty nasty guys. Um, for, but for their time, they kind of did what people did at that time. They kind of landed and conquered. That was what you did. Um, it was even thought to be successful to do that. Um, people uh, at the time, the statues were made of you and books and all the rest. That was what you did. If you woke up and you were an 18-year-old and you wanted to be successful in the 1600s, you uh, went and you mapped out new worlds and you, uh, you made it your own. So, so anyway, but they came along and, and by modern standards, they weren't very nice to the locals that they found. And uh, it led to a whole bunch of subjugation and oppression and there's no argument there. And, and, and you, can, you can have that conversation and you can dwell on it as long as you like. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the ancestors of those people basically don't exist anymore. Um, the, nobody really is, 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 you can't hold anyone physically responsible you can you can point at people you kind of go well they're similar they're a bit the same you know i speak a bit of a funny language that's similar to those guys uh, they kind of have ancestors that might have known those people um yeah let's 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 go after them um it's it's just not a particularly helpful yeah. um thing to do um, and I, I mean i think you you've already said that you know taking from kind of the rich to give to the poor the robin hood example yeah. Yeah. You know, we know this. If you took the, the, the sort of, what, five, six million white people in the country and you had a genocide, you know, because, hey, why not? Julius says that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Um, and you just got rid of all of them overnight. Uh, yeah. And uh, you then accessed all their wealth. And you took all their money and their cars and their houses and all their stuff. And you gave it to the remaining 50 million people in the country that weren't white. There wouldn't be enough to go around. No one's getting uplifted. But if you allow checkers to grow by 10 times its current size, right? Mm. Then suddenly your unemployment problem is gone. Yeah. If you don't chase Anglo-American out the country because you threaten mining charters and make it uncomfortable for them to even think of doing business here, um, instead of losing 120,000 mining jobs within two years of those mining strikes where those Lonman and um, Maricana and all the rest of those miners wanted 12,500 rand a month guaranteed for everyone no matter what they did, um, if you don't have that situation, you instead of losing 120,000 jobs, maybe you gain three, four, five 500,000 jobs. If you look at the mining industry in Australia, the mining industry in South America, um, you know uh, th- the these question? are these are these are some of the things that can that that can be done. Yeah. So, well, the question is if you see the value of rather growing the market through a capitalist free market approach yeah. or, or whether you still think government should have this much control to kind yeah, of look, make race-based policy. Look, um, free markets, I believe in those, right? Mm. Um, but, but here's the thing, right? One thing that I struggle to accept, right? Maybe I'll accept it, but right now I, I struggle to accept is that whatever happened a generation ago doesn't have an effect of what's happening today. You know? That on an, on an economic perspective, that what happened a generation ago has no implications whatsoever of what's happening today. That, that I struggle to accept, right? Um, I agree in terms of growing the economy, of course. Economic growth, right? is what we need, right, for employment and so on and so forth, right? But one would argue that the inequality, right, is actually part of the slow economic growth, right? In a sense that you have a huge majority of black people, right, who are poor, right, and you have a small group of mostly white people and black people who are above middle class, upper class, and so on and so forth, right? If you had more black people who were economically, right, or economically uh, active, who had better skills, who could generate an income for themselves, that in itself would grow the economy. Because mm-hmm. if you have more black people who can buy stuff, right, then that shop right 
can actually make more profits, right? And I also have another theory you know, that it's actually strategic, more strategic to develop the average black person than it is to develop the average, I'll say, other person, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it like that, right? Or let me say black and colored, because black and colored people are sort of like, if you look at the stats, they're like the same in terms of poverty levels, right? right. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Yeah? So if you take, okay, uh, if you take like the average black person, right, yeah? and let's say he gets an education, he's able to start his own business or work a proper job, yeah? that black person is then able to help out his siblings, right? And his siblings are able to buy stuff, right? Mm. Can be furniture, can be phones, can be whatever, or houses or cars or things like that, right? If you help the average white person, right? Let's say the, the, the same white person was poor, whatever. Yeah? I'm talking statistics. I, I know I'm generalizing, I know. Um, that white person, the chances of him having to help out his siblings is less, right? His siblings most likely have already bought cars and other things and furniture and things like that, right? So, and there's only a limit to what a person can actually buy, right? So do you see that with the same amount of money given to the white person or to the black person, you're more likely to gain more economic activity from developing the black person because the black person spreads that money. They and grow from a lower base. Yes, well, you this, see what I'm is, saying? This is the, the black tax argument. Is Look, that, I'm not, it's, it's, not, it's not a black text. No, it's just about, it's, it's, it's about it's, it's like, it's inequality like, yeah, is the reason for yeah. Yeah. a bit so, of yeah. the economic stagnation. Yes, yeah, so, 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 yes, exactly. Thank you. The, the, the economic stagnation. So this type of empowerment actually becomes like an economic strategy, if you look at it. This, it, it comes more than just uh, race-based policy. Mm but it yeah. actually becomes an actual economic strategy. Hey, Jimmy, believe me, if the government said, white you don't give a shit about you, just do what you need to do, I'll, I'll be, like, happy as a pig in shit. Wouldn't you, Jonathan? <laughs> I mean, we're not white. If the government left uh, us alone. Yeah, but, like but, benevolent neglect. <laughs> white you do what you want, we don't care, just pay your taxes. I'll be like, cool, man. Um, no worries I mean, at all. I mean, but, Sorry, yeah, but the taxes, the, the taxes, the, the taxes we pay yeah. is not going to development anyway. Yeah, it looks good. It's, it's going to the development of a few hundred thousand cadres at the top exactly. there. So it's it's a fundamental. <laughs> we keep talking about like principles and theory, but the fundamental thing, the ANC is absolute shit. Oh no, I mean, all of this. Let's, I mean, let's talk about, about an example. Exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you keep saying if you develop, if you develop, but yeah. who is developing? I mean, the two things here. There's there's there's, there's the Famous Chris Hart entitlement argument, yeah. um, which was misinterpreted, but is essentially uh, sometimes you need to grab the, the bull by the horns. In fact, most times in life, you need to grab the bull by the horns. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to find many successful people who said, you know, one day I was just sitting on a park bench wondering why my life was so shit. And someone just came up to me and said, would you like this multi-million dollar company? And I was like, hey, that'll be awesome. Um, nobody did that. And um, it, it, it usually doesn't take... Uh, higher degrees to achieve success either. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So relative success, sure, but to achieve great success, um, actually a, a, a peer-reviewed peer article I saw that was published, I think this past week, which showed that the most successful people in the world are jack of all trades and masters of none. So these are not people who go and study MBAs or get PhDs or things like that. These are people who know a, a little bit about a lot of things. The Elon Musks of the world who kind of think out the box and someone goes, you can't just launch a rocket. And he goes, why? And, you know, you can't just dig tunnels under Los Angeles. And he goes, why? Um, you can't be the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> he says, fuck yeah, I can. <laughs> so, so, you know, but, but I think, you know, the, back to the reality, which is, um, who's going to do all the stuff? So some of it, I agree with you, incentivize, that's a nice idea. Um, tax deductions, all those things aren't bad. The CETA stuff hasn't really worked that well. I, I know a lot of um, companies that have tried this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it also, one of the problems is the entitlement side of things. So they just find some random dude and go, hey, you want a one-year internship where you'll learn this? And then it's like a random dude who may not necessarily be interested in that, but it's an opportunity for a, like a job of sorts, yeah, yeah, yeah. plus some education and hope for something better after that. And, you know, everyone's trying to uplift themselves, but it, it's, it's not the best sort of format. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to remember something. 
The ANC government came in and the education system we can agree was not ideal for anyone, um, specifically for black people. Yeah. Um, and so let's say um, it's not unreasonable that they should have been given half a decade to repair that and to say this is the new curriculum yeah. and we're going to – and they do in fact dedicate a very large portion of our budget. Education and health are the two largest aspects of our budget um, next to the VIP uh, protection unit. Um, and – and they did dedicate a huge portion of funds to it. Um, and unfortunately, if you look at the numbers, uh, up to a million people, uh, children, enroll in grade one every year. Mm -hmm. um, you get, I think, down to about uh, 600,000 who actually end up in matric and about 300,000 or so who pass. Or, uh, you know, the numbers are not great. Mm -hmm. um, but what, if you look at that number, it hasn't always been a million, but let's take it at an at, at a 800,000 over the last 20 years that they should have done something. Mm -hmm. Talk about 16 million people. Mm -hmm. I think my maths is right. Yeah. Um, you talk about 16 million people that the government has let down. We know from research in places like the United States of America, the only in a, so in an economy that just works, right? In a, in a capitalist economy, the three things you need to become middle class in that economy, very simple, finish school, so it assumes a semi-decent education. The American education is not the best in the world. Mm -hmm. It's average. Mm -hmm. um, so you need an average high school matriculant medication, uh, education, yeah. right? The, the second thing is um, don't have kids until you're married. And the third thing is get a job, any job. That can be a job flipping burgers at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And if you get that job, keep the job, um, you will end up middle class. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no reason that the same logic wouldn't apply in the South African context. Mm -hmm. But we now have 16 million people that were not let down by apartheid. Mm -hmm. They were let down by the ANC government. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and I think that there needs to be a real... Um, reality check on that and we can carry on going oh but the you know the white people own most of the companies and which is not necessarily true actually that 80 percent jse thing is crap um it's 16 percent i think now uh which is it's down to but the 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 reality is we can carry on doing that stuff or we can go look the fundamentals are we need to at minimum educate children up to a decent high school level and then you don't necessarily need to educate them a kid who finishes high school has enough mathematics knowledge and enough knowledge of the world to be able to go i want to start a business doing this or that mm -hmm. um if you if you travel um, it, it, through africa i don't know how much um, traveling you've done but if you go to countries like nigeria mm -hmm. um the the entrepreneurship is incredible mm -hmm. incredible and guys you know make a living off it they they, they not all of them end up with giant companies or whatever it is mm -hmm. but they they do well for themselves mm -hmm. and i think we severely underestimate the entrepreneurship in townships if you read a book yeah. like cassie economics by what's his name gg orcock mm -hmm. like he talks about these these you know these businesses are not uh you know uh, represented on the cipc or in sales or anything like that, but people are making a good living having taxis or a spaza shop or a mechanic or whatever you want, a tuck shop, a restaurant, a shabine, like all this money is being generated anyway. Mm. It's just not in the so-called formal, yeah, formal economy, so to speak. Yeah. But sooner or later, people have to be told, you know, yeah. it's hard work and take opportunities where you can get them and have a long-term game at the end of the day, you know. But yeah, yeah. fees must fall wanting free education uh, to the detriment of basic education. Like I find that deplorable. Yeah. In most ways. Yeah, look, I, I agree that, uh, of course, you can't proportion everything mm. on apartheid. Of course, I agree with that. And also, I agree with that the failures of the ENC, mm. you know, and that's actually part of why we are establishing movements, you know, yeah. as a way of, of, of reacting and actually doing something, you mm. know, um, and petitioning something, mm. you know. So I fully agree with what you've said right now, mm. you know, in terms of uh, the failures that came with the ENC. Uh, I think the only thing is that I also acknowledge what happened before ANC and say that the ANC, of course, compounded it, right? But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, mm. you know? No, of course. And, and then, that's not our argument at all. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and we have to look at it holistically, 
you know and, and that's that's pretty much that's pretty much real what I'm saying no yeah. we can agree with that yeah, yeah. so just in terms of actual like campaigns that you are doing through the collab movement like yes. what is it what are you actually doing so if you want to go the, to the collab movement is, is started like end of last year right that's when we started we launched it okay it's relatively right. new it's fairly new uh, what we are going to be doing now is going to universities and start mobilizing getting students together you know right uh, a lot of the things that we've done so far was sort of like on a higher level we've written like um, a response to the finance minister on his economic policy it was, it was great compiling it because it was people from different backgrounds it was lecturers people in law people in economics you know small group but really people with like really good knowledge you know right. where we actually formulated um of a response based on him and added our ideas, you know. So a lot of the things that we are, we've been doing were a bit high level, but now we are putting boots on the ground and now we're getting, like, uh, proper activism, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I don't think anyone can sort of disagree with that. Just make sure, a little tip hmm. for someone who's done a little bit of activism, make people excited about the ideas. Yeah. Like, unity as an idea is not sexy. Yeah. You need, like, to make compelling arguments to make it like really uh, exciting for people to join and then you got a winner I yeah, think cool. oh, but I think so. we broadly agree like on 90% of stuff it's good to spar a little bit yeah um, <laughs> I don't I don't know what we fundamentally disagreed on maybe just a bit of the racial I think it's yeah, on the policies. I think it's on the I think I think people in general want the same thing yeah. I think people want uh, to live in a world that's well, where the inequality is 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 low, you know, because uh, depends uh, how you define that. No, no, no. But now we're opening but, a box. <laughs> no, no, no. No, what I'm saying is, we understand that the poverty is a problem to everyone. Sure. Either the person who lives in poverty, or the person not in poverty, because if we have a country that's majority poor, whether you own a restaurant, um, I'm not even talking about the crime. If there were less poor people, you'd have more traffic in your restaurant, mm -hmm. you know? Of course. If you had businesses, you'd have more people who have access that, to, to that business, you know? So it's within everyone's interest, really, you know, to cut down the number of poor people as much as possible, right? Absolutely. So I think we all agree on that. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just the processes of doing it. That's yeah. What I mean, <laughs> well, that's I mean people kill each other. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, you got uh, everyone wants uh, to be happy and healthy, but some people want Bernie Sanders to give it all to them, <laughs> and other people want Donald Trump to let them be free to find their own way to it. So, um, you know, two different ways to come at the same problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think we can. <laughs> we can. Uh, we can leave at it least, at that. At least we agree on that. All right, Jimmy. Where can people find you, my friend? Uh, social media. I'm very active on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. All social medias, I'm Jimmy Ramahopa. Just name, surname. I think I'm the only one, hey? For the white people, that's K-G-O-P-A. <laughs> thank you. Ramahopa. <laughs> Get it right, people. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, and they also, Politics SA, uh, also... Dot Coza as well. Dot Coza. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. My website is Uh Yeah, so, yeah, people actually contact me through the website and I never thought, but it's, it's, it's nice. Mm. So people yeah. share their ideas, people, you know, it's a nice way of um, exchanging ideas and sort of like, because we are in, in the early stages of the collab movement also, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 it's quite nice to see people coming through in the early stages so that we can actually develop something that will actually work and not necessarily just rushed, you know. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, if you can get more students away from politics, <laughs> I'm a happy man. Irrespective of whether it's EFF or Student Command or DASO or P what PYC. 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 Whatever Sorry. they're called. If, if students don't do politics, I'll, I'll be a happy man indeed. Right. Jimmy, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank Appreciate you for joining us. Time. Thank you, guys. Thank you for hosting me. This was good. I, I like engagements and... Yeah. Yeah. You know. Hopefully it was fair. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> no, it was no, fair. No, uh, thank you to Vodcast TV for hosting us once again. You can find them in Rosebank Mall opposite Turtle Sports on the other side of Turtle Sports. It has two entrances. It's a bit confusing. And other than that, you can find us uh, renegadereport.ca.za. Please give us money. It's not January <laughs> anymore, so you've got some. No more excuses. 
nice, um, nice plug, Ramon. Yeah. And on Twitter at Renegade underscore Report, Facebook page and group, uh, Ramon at Roman Kavanagh, myself at Jonathan underscore Wit, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.